What is up guys, Randomonium here, and this is part two of my beginner's guide to League of Legends. Obviously, this is a follow-up video to my original beginner's guide to League of Legends, so if you haven't watched that one yet, I highly recommend it. In the first beginner's guide, we covered some basic history of League and answered the question, what is League of Legends? We went over some game basics and briefly discussed runes, summoner spells, and items. We also covered the map layout and the roles you can play. Finally, we talked about objectives, phases of the game, and basic strategy. Before we get into the meat of this video, I want to cover something really quick that I probably should have covered in my first video, toxicity. League, like every other online game, has issues with people being toxic towards one another. And since a league is so complex, it can feel pretty frustrating to deal with toxic people telling you that you're bad while you're trying to learn how to play the game. The good news is, is that toxic players are a minority in league, and Riot does have a system in place to deal with toxicity. Toxic players who are reported face chat restrictions, temporary bans, and even permanent bans for flagrant toxic behavior. There's also an honor system in place, and toxic players with low honor are punished by not receiving ranked rewards and not being able to participate in certain game modes like Clash. If you encounter someone toxic in your games, all you need to do is mute them. Muting is very easily done by pushing the mute button next to the person's name on the scoreboard, which is by default open by pressing and holding tab. You can also type slash mute insert the player's name to mute a player. You can also type slash mute all to mute all people in the game. When the game is over, you can report the player for toxic behavior in the post-game lobby by clicking the report button near the player's name. Do not engage in toxic behavior if someone is being toxic to you. This could result in you being punished as well. Riot does not care who started it or which person was more toxic. Do not ask others to report toxic players. The system does not give additional weight to reports if multiple reports are made, since that would mean that a group of toxic players could falsely report a solo player. A single report is all that is needed to trigger a review. I know it can be tempting to flame people back, but please do not stoop to their level. Simply mute, report, and keep trying to improve and have fun. All right, so now that that's out of the way, we can focus on the meat of this video. This video is here to answer one of the most fundamental questions of League. How do you win? It seems like a simple question to answer, but as you'll see, it's a bit more complicated than most people think. So when most people start playing League, all they focus on is kills. League is a PvP game after all, so why wouldn't you focus on killing the other human players? Killing people shows that you're better than them, and if you're better than them, you should win, right? Wrong. Kills don't directly result in you winning. The key word in that sentence is directly. Yes, kills can indirectly help you win if you use them correctly. However, I've seen games where players have 20 to 30 kills apiece, and they still lose. You could have hundreds or even thousands of kills, and you'll never reach a point where the game automatically ends and gives you a victory screen due to kills alone. League is not a deathmatch, so saying that kills is how you win is a complete and total logical fallacy. So if it's not kills that result in wins, then what is it? What directly allows you to win games? Well, the only way you can win in League is if the enemy nexus is destroyed. So that seems like a good place to start to construct a logical argument for what wins games. So now, instead of having question marks, we now know that destroying the nexus wins games. I know at this point you're probably saying, thanks, Random, that doesn't help me. Hold up a sec. This was just the first of many steps, so just bear with me for a little bit. All right, so destroying the Nexus is how you win games. So how do you destroy the Nexus? Well, the Nexus is untargetable unless you kill both Nexus Towers. So the next logical step is to destroy the Nexus Towers. 
So how do you destroy the Nexus Towers? Well, the Nexus Towers are untargetable unless you destroy an inhibitor, so that is the next logical step working backwards. So how do you destroy the inhibitor? Well, the inhibitor is also untargetable unless you destroy that inhibitor's tower. So that's the next logical step. So how do you destroy the inhibitor tower? Well, the only way to attack the inhibitor tower is to destroy the inner tower in the same lane. Alright, so how do you destroy the inner tower? Well, the inner tower can only be attacked if you destroy the outer tower in that lane. I think you're seeing the pattern here. Destroying towers, not killing enemy champions, is how you win games. Your goal should always be to destroy towers. Yes, getting kills can help make destroying towers easier, but ultimately, kills are just gravy. Your real focus should always be figuring out how you can take more towers. We have a phrase for this in League. It's called objective control. So we can simplify our big long chain of tower destruction into a single block called objective control. Now towers aren't the only objective out there. We have Drakes, we have Rift Herald, we also have the powerful Elder Dragon and Baron Nasher. All of these objectives help you win because they help you destroy towers, either directly or indirectly. So the next logical question would be, how do you have objective control? Well, if you've noticed, all of the objectives that you want to control are either in the river or past the river on the enemy side of the map. So in order to control those objectives, you have to control more than half the map. When I'm in the game, I try to imagine a line that I call the pressure line. The pressure line is defined by where each champion from both teams are located. The pressure line tells me where my team is strong and where my team is weak. It also tells me what objectives we can take and which of our objectives are in danger. Whichever team controls more than 50% of the map through the pressure line is said to have map pressure. They are the team that is on the offensive. They are the team that is setting the tempo of the game and the other team is forced to react to them. Map pressure is what allows you to have objective control. So ideally we want to maximize the amount of time that our team has map pressure. That said, you can't have map pressure 100% of the time. There's an ebb and flow to map pressure, and knowing when to relieve map pressure is just as important as knowing when to exert it. Map pressure, objective control, tempo, these are all extremely complex topics within League. I'm not going to be able to cover every possible situation in this video relating to those topics. However, I will give you a taste of how map pressure can be employed. If you'd like me to do more videos on this topic, let me know by leaving a comment below. Alright, let's say we're 10 minutes into the game and the enemy team has grouped 5 bot to siege bot lane tower. However, like a boss, your warding has been on point and you spot the 5 man dive seconds before they're planning to spring the trap. What should your team do? Well, if we draw the pressure line on the map, we can see that the enemy team controls more than 50% of the map, so they have map pressure. Furthermore, because they have so many people bot lane, their map pressure actually extends behind the bot outer tower, which means that even if our bot laner and support stay under tower, they are still extremely vulnerable. The most common response I've seen people give in this situation is, I'm going to stay bot, I'm going to defend my tower, even if it means that I die. Furthermore, many people will insist that their team should rotate down to help them. You'll frequently hear, 5 bot, why aren't you guys here? Why aren't you rotating? Where are the missing pings? So, are they right? Should your team all rotate down to assist bot lane? Absolutely not. Rotating late to stop a play is an inefficient use of time, which results in the enemy team having unchallenged map pressure for free. In this situation, bot lane is pretty much gone. It's going to fall, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. So why would you try to save it? That will most likely only result in more people dying and the tower falling anyway. So, what's the right answer to this question? It's simple. Take back over half the map in the quickest way possible so that your team has map pressure and the enemy team has to respond to you. 
You've already got three people on the top side of the map, so the clear answer is to just push mid and top. Who cares if they have pressure in bot lane? Your team has pressure in mid lane and top lane. Abandon bot lane and trade objectives in mid lane and top lane. This shifts the pressure line so that now your team is in control. This makes it so the enemy team has to respond to you. Do they continue pushing bot? Do they rotate mid to try and stop your push mid? And as we'll see, whatever option they choose also has a clear counter. If the enemy team continues to push bot with all five members, then your team should focus their five members mid lane and top lane. Yes, their team will take bottom towers slightly faster than you, but overall, your team will be at an advantage because you're applying pressure to two lanes while they're only applying pressure to one. Towers become harder and harder to crack the deeper you go, so ultimately destroying mid and top outer towers is easier than destroying both bot outer and bot inner towers. What if the entire enemy team goes mid? Well, first off, congratulations, you just stopped their bot lane push without even having to contest in bot lane. That's the power of map pressure. You can get the enemy team to stop pushing objectives that they could take because they're afraid of the objectives that you could take. If that's the case, then your jungle and mid will just rotate top to assist in taking top tower, and your bot lane and support can begin pushing bot to create pressure bot. Now you've sacrificed pressure in mid lane, but you still have pressure in two lanes while the enemy team only has pressure in one. This keeps the enemy team on the back foot, which forces them to either rotate back bot to stop the push in bot lane, or rotate top to stop the push in top lane. In either case, your team is winning, because while the enemy team is running around from lane to lane, your team is getting damage on towers. All you need to do is make sure you don't get caught and back off before they get there. Well, what if the enemy team splits their focus? What if they send two or three mid and keep the rest of the team pushing bot? This is where you can fight. You've already rotated your bot laner and your support into your red side jungle, so you will have the advantage in a bot side river fight as long as they keep at least two people in bot lane. This allows your team to get a few kills and keep the pressure on mid and top. Just be mindful of the remaining members on the enemy team and don't overextend in the fight, or you may find yourself in a 4v5 if the rest of the enemy team rotates. So I think we've pretty clearly established that map pressure allows you to have objective control, and objective control is how you win games. So now the next question we must ask is how do you establish map pressure? Well, we've already demonstrated one of the attributes that assists in map pressure, which is good decision making. We'll talk about good decision making more in a little bit, but for right now I want to focus on the other attribute that makes up map pressure, which is champion strength. Obviously, the stronger your champion is, the more potential map pressure they can exert, because they can clear waves faster, they can take towers faster, and they can kill enemies easier. So what makes your champion stronger? That ultimately comes down to skill, gold, and experience. Out of the three, skill is the hardest to define. Skill is also something ultimately that cannot be taught. You can watch thousands of videos on how to do combos with champions, but ultimately, if you don't put a lot of time practicing those combos, your skill is not going to improve. And it's not just that practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect. It's not enough to practice, because if you're practicing the wrong things, then all you're doing is learning how to do things wrong better. At the end of the day, my ability to help you with skill is limited. I do not consider myself a master on any champion, and even if I did, I cannot transfer the skills I have gained to you. You have to put in that effort if you want to gain that skill. The other two areas that determine champion strength are gold and experience. I don't care how good someone is, if I put them up against a level 18 champion with full build and they're level 1 with just their starting item, they're going to lose. So how do you increase your gold and experience? Well the primary ways you increase gold is towers, CS, and kills, 
and the primary ways you increase experience is CS and kills. Remember how I told you the kills do indirectly result in you winning games? This is how. Kills increase champion strength, which, when combined with good decision making, allows you to gain map pressure. Map pressure allows you to gain objective control, and objective control is how you win. But, as we've clearly shown, kills are just one small piece of the puzzle. You need to do everything in order to maximize your chance to win. So that's everything that goes into champion strength. And for the most part, that branch of winning is up to you. I can't help you CS better, and I can't tell you the exact moment to go in for a kill. I can't tell you how to become the best team of player in the world, nor can I show you how to perform the cleanest inset your Iron 4 teammates have ever seen. At the end of the day, champion strength is up to you. It's up to you how much you practice and how much you learn. What I can help you with, however, is good decision making. That's ultimately what this channel is all about, how to make better decisions. Now, there are a lot of things that go into good decision making. For this video, I'm going to simplify it down to what I see as the big four. Correct build, timing, vision control, and smart fights. Having the correct build means buying the correct items given the current game state. At the simplest level, this can break down to buying armor if there's someone fed on the enemy team who deals physical damage, and buying magic resist if there's someone fed on the enemy team who deals magic damage. However, this topic becomes extremely complex when you really get into the weeds. When do you buy Merc Treads over Ninja Tabbies? When do you buy Adaptive Helm instead of Spirit Massage? When do you buy Executioner's Calling instead of Lord Dominic's Regard? There are hundreds, maybe even thousands of questions you can ask about items like this. Correct build even applies to things like runes and summoner spells before the game even starts. I will definitely go into all of this stuff in more detail in a future video, so if this is a topic that interests you, please let me know by leaving a comment. Timing is arguably an even more complex topic. When are you going to hit level 2? When is your opponent? What are the cooldowns on his abilities? When is his first item power spike? When is yours? What side did the jungler start? When are his camps responding? When is he most likely to gank your lane? Thousands of questions, all relating to timing. Timing is everything in League. A second too fast, a second too slow, and a good decision becomes a bad one. Instead of getting first blood, you give it. Instead of getting a baron, you get aced. Instead of winning, you lose. Like champion builds, this topic is so complex that it deserves its own video. For now, it's just enough that you become mindful of timing and be aware that it fundamentally shapes the game and its outcome. People often oversimplify vision control. It's not simply warding. It's not simply buying vision wards. It's how you place your wards, when you place your wards, where you place your wards, and why you place your wards. Wards are a limited resource, a valuable commodity that when used properly can shut down enemy plans before they have even begun and ensure your team is safe to take their next objective. And vision control isn't just about establishing your own vision lines, it's also about denying enemy vision. The threat of the unknown can often be a more powerful deterrent than true strength. If the enemy doesn't know where you are, then they have to assume you're everywhere or risk being killed. Vision control isn't just useful for spotting enemies, it allows you to engage in psychological warfare against your enemy. It allows you to get inside their head and make their greatest fears a reality, paralyzing their ability to act or react. The final aspect of correct decision making is smart fights. I often hear people say, we can fight, we can fight. That's not the correct question to answer though. You shouldn't be asking, can we fight? The question you should be asking is, should we fight? That's the difference between fighting and fighting smart. There's no point in fighting unless the rewards outweigh the risks. You are never guaranteed to win a fight. Even if you're 10,000 gold ahead, no fight is guaranteed. So you always have to ask yourself, what do we gain by winning the fight? And what do we lose by losing the fight? At its most basic level, every fight is a dice roll, 
and the best way to ensure you win is to weigh the dice as much as you can in your favor. There's one final thing we need to add to our diagram. If you utilize correct decision making, if you build correctly and are mindful of timings, if you have proper vision control and fight smart fights, then ultimately you will get more towers, more CS, and more kills. And thus we see that correct decision making also influences champion strength, which is why the main focus in this channel is correct decision making. This is the dirty little secret about League that no one tells you about. Decision making is how you truly win. You can be extremely skilled with your champion, you can see us well, you can have a level lead, but if you have the decision making skills of a Muppet, then you won't climb. It won't matter how good your KDA is, it won't matter how many pentakills you get, or how many 1v5s you win, you will eventually plateau and be unable to climb. Let's take our example of a Silver Yasuo main. This particular Silver Yasuo is actually quite good with Yasuo, so we give him a skill score of 90 out of 100. He's also quite good at CSing and gaining experience, so we give him a score of 80 out of 100 in each of those areas. This gives him a total score of 250, which should be high enough to easily climb out of Silver. However, our Silver Yasuo is prone to tilting and overconfident. He lets his emotions and the animalistic part of his brain make his decisions for him instead of using the frontal cortex that his ancestors have blessed him with after millions of years of evolution. As a result, our Silver Yasuo only makes correct decisions about 40% of the time. This means that his great score of 250 is now cut to 100, which is exactly what we would expect from a player struggling in Silver. The point of this example isn't to make fun of Silver Yasuo's. The point is to demonstrate that you can't neglect any part of this diagram. It is all important. It is all necessary in order to maximize your chances to win. You have to be honest with yourselves if you want to improve. Look at this diagram and figure out where your flaws are. Maybe you choose smart fights, but you have poor vision control. Maybe you CS well, but you don't use the most optimal builds. Each person is different, and it's up to you to be self-reflective and figure out what you need to work on. Another really interesting aspect of League is that you often need to temporarily sacrifice map pressure in order to make your champion stronger. This is most evident for junglers. Junglers can either be farming their jungle or ganking. Farming increases their champion strength while ganking exerts map pressure. Too much farming and your team will fall behind and it's basically a 4v5 and the enemy team will constantly have map pressure. Too much ganking and the jungler will begin to fall behind in CS and levels and his ganks will lose potency because he'll be barely stronger than a cannon minion. You have to balance between the two. And the way you balance between making your champion stronger and exerting map pressure is through good decision making. Let's use an example to explain how good decision making can help us balance between these two options. Infernal Drake is about to spawn, and it's looking like both teams are itching for a team fight. However, there's a massive wave in top lane that is pushing and will most likely take a top tower if someone doesn't go and clear it. So what should our top laner do? If he goes top to clear the wave, his team could lose Infernal Drake or fight a 4v5 team fight and lose. However, if he tries to help his team, then the opposing team could just stall and he'll wind up losing out on multiple waves of gold and experience. It seems like a lose-lose situation for him. But what if we rewind the game clock one minute? Now that big massive wave isn't as close to the turret as it was before. What if our top laner, realizing that Infernal Drake is going to spawn in a minute, and knowing that he needs to be there for a fight, steps up and clears the wave right away? Now that pressure is relieved, and he's free to rotate mid to contest the Drake. It sounds simple, but it's amazing how often these opportunities are missed in games. This is the power of good decision making and anticipation. It can turn a lose-lose situation into a win-win situation. At the end of the day, what League comes down to is efficiency. 
the team that most effectively utilizes their time and most effectively utilizes their champion strengths is the team that most often wins. You should always be asking yourself, is this the best use of my time? Am I farming when I should be team fighting? Am I roaming when I should be warding? Am I playing aggressive when I should be playing safe? And one of the keys to being efficient with your time is anticipation. You need to read the map and anticipate how it's going to change in the next minute. How are the waves pushing? Where do you have vision? What wards are going to time out? What jungle camps are up? What jungle camps will be up in the next minute? What's the next big objective that both teams are going to want to take? You constantly have to anticipate what both your team and the enemy team is going to want to do. Mindfulness, self-reflection, hard work. This is how you improve, not just at League, but in all things. If you're twice as efficient as someone else, then you're going to go twice as far or improve twice as much with the same amount of effort. Efficiency is everything. If you take one thing away from this video, it's to work on improving your efficiency. And the only way you can improve your efficiency is being honest with yourself. None of us are perfect. It's only by realizing our flaws that we have any hope to improve. And that's about everything that I wanted to cover with this video. This video obviously opens up a lot of opportunities for this series, and I do plan on doing follow-up videos on all aspects of good decision-making, as well as talking more about map pressure and objective control. If there's something in particular you want me to cover, please leave a comment on what video you think I should do next. I try to distill this video down as much as possible, so if I lost you at any point during the video, or if something doesn't make sense, please let me know. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, and if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing or joining our Discord. I hope you all have a fantastic day. This is Randomonium, signing off.